Welcome back, everyone, to Security Weekly's Virtual Hacker Summer Camp. I'm Paul Asadorian, joined by Matt Alderman. Yeah, you, we, you and it's I get to do us. a segment. Well, uh, I know, it's the only time we've done it all week. Well, I thought we'd talk about home network security, since it seems to be a hot topic. It is. Um, it, it's come up quite a bit, actually, in our interviews with enterprise security folks, because everyone in the enterprise is working from home and so it seems to be taking a spotlight i know uh we've done some segments on it i know the bhis folks have done i think joff did a, a webcast on it um and i just wanted to talk a little bit about what the approaches might be uh i've got some potential solutions but i haven't fully implemented them so i'm hoping to have some tyler and i we're promising to have a technical segments coming up soon but i thought we'd take the opportunity just you know based on what we talked about matt talk about some of the challenges and how we might carve up the network mm -hmm. and we've seen some different approaches in the past we, week we or have. two right yeah i mean so at home i i have my network segmented mm -hmm. i have my office and my recording studio on a separate uh subnet than all the other devices in my house one because i don't want much bandwidth <laughs> usage right. across that but link. how do you do that in wi-fi like, uh, do you have to plug in to be on your segment? Uh, That's so how mine is I now. Can't, yeah, so I can't. I have to enable Wi-Fi to cross over mm -hmm. because my Wi-Fi connections on the other isolated segment. So my two uh, machines at home are uh, direct connected mm -hmm. directly into my uh, r my gig router downstairs, right. and then I have another segment that the Wi-Fi and everything else, my TVs, all the kids' yeah. Wi-Fi connections, and everything. So if I need to get on that network for something, then I'll enable my Wi-Fi and, mm -hmm. and be able to cross over. But I've tried to keep them as isolated as possible because I don't want that crossover, right? right? When you get into further segmentation, one of my ideas, and I haven't done this at home, I experimented with here in the office, um, Ubiquity Access Point Support VLANs. So if you can VLAN your network, mm. you can connect the Ubiquity to a trunk port and VLAN tag it, and then assign... Uh, tagged VLANs to SSIDs. Oh. I, I think that's kind of, in, in my design for home networking, that's kind of table stakes. And, and again, like the gear for that is interesting. I'm not sure how, if there are other solutions that do it. I don't know how you do it without VLAN tagging. I guess if it's all Wi-Fi, you can create different SSIDs. Wi-Fi SSIDs, SSIDs yeah. Is, yeah. is one way. But a lot of my stuff that I want to segment is mixed. Some of it's wired, some of it's wireless, Right. right? And even for my own usage, like I want to put my phone, my tablet, my laptop, and my desktop on a separate VLAN that's treated differently than the rest of it. And that requires mix, that requires basically, uh, well, I'm using Cisco small business gear. Uh, I forget what it's called now. What is the line? They changed the name a couple of times. Oh, we gosh, covered some I vulnerabilities remember, yeah. on it, actually. But it's their uh, SMB uh, kind of series switches, which can get pretty cheap. I, I bought some pretty cheap, right? And the Ubiquity gear, which I already had and I've just been adding on right. slowly over the years, that gives you the ability to create VLANs and the ability to have SSIDs that are assigned to a VLAN. So in, in my design, that's kind of important, right? Because I, I want to segment a little more. I want to have the Paul subnet and VLAN, right? Yep. Paul network, which is totally separate from everything else. Because right. then you can apply quality of service yep. and all that which stuff. Which I do, yeah. And if you don't have multiple interfaces on your firewall, PFSense will actually do VLAN tagging as well. So you could have multiple virtual interfaces on your wired firewall, right? Because I always separate them too. Uh, that's the other thing. Like I have my firewall. It does firewalling and routing. And I've got my Wi-Fi, and that does all the Wi-Fi stuff, and they're separate, right? I never liked combining them on one device because right. when we wrote the book about WRT54G routers and you get into the performance on those, I'm like, no, that's atrocious. Right? Yeah, and I, the modern ones are, are probably better. I haven't looked at the architecture, but like on older stuff, you'd have four ports, but it was only one network interface. And so they essentially had one interface that it was a hub to four ports <laughs> on no. the back of it. So you think you're getting four dedicated gig ports. Check your specs. You got to go read the schematics right. and uh, the, what's under the hood. Maybe take it apart and take pictures and start Googling for the numbers on the chips uh, and the diagrams to see exactly. So that's why as time went on, I'm like, nope, I have switches that do switching. I have firewall routers that do that. And I have access points and they're all separate. 
right? Because yeah. at home, we get a lot of devices, and a lot of them are latency and bandwidth yeah. for stuff we do for well, recording and stuff we do people right. do for streaming. Which is why I don't connect into my Wi-Fi router mm -hmm. because I'm, I'm bandwidth limited 750 right. plus everybody else is on that. So I go straight to the gig. Then my CenturyLink router downstairs gives me the ability to do firewalling and four uh, gig port switches off of it. Mm -hmm. So two go to the office, one yep. for the recording studio, one for my uh, office machine. And then one goes to the access point, mm -hmm. and then any hardwired goes into the access point. So I'm kind of concentrating that there. So I've done some level of that separation, right, right. Um, but I do, I still have a little mix as well. We we interviewed Drew Cohen on BSW a I couple that weeks was ago. Really interesting. Yeah, yeah, I think it was called Yikes. Because uh, the R designs like it requires a lot of network engineering. Like the more things you right. split up, the more because uh, I have to make the cutover. So I have to take my wireless network, mm -hmm. which is on this static VLAN, right? The big flat network. And with, uh, I have two SSIDs. I split the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz uh, wireless standards, right? Uh, to two separate SSIDs. But those are both on the same VLAN and subnet. Yep. And now to make that change, I've got to basically reconfigure everything, yeah. right? I got to push a new config out and then do the troubleshooting. And during that time, like stuff is may not work, right? That's the beauty of building a brand new house. I just designed it that way yeah. from scratch. Well, I didn't I, have I to it, uh, it yeah, over. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But Yikes was interesting when Drew was talking about it. Is mm. creates this micro segmentation within the network, so that you don't have to be a network engineer to figure out how to do it. Supposedly, this product kind of automatically does it for you. I mean, we haven't had a chance to test it, but the concept sounded interesting where... Yeah, like, how does that work? Is it one device I put on my network? And it's I think it was one device, and mm -hmm. then each uh, device that's connecting into that device kind of creates its own kind of micro-segmented environment, so mm -hmm. it couldn't see any other things. You'd literally have to poke the holes right. through it, and probably and as a policy. there was an enterprise security company that was doing the same thing, too, and I can't remember what the name of it mm. was. Yeah, I don't know. It was years ago now, but the, the that was interesting. I it was too, yeah, because you can't expect uh, your average everyday. I mean, us as network engineers, you know, Joff, Tyler, and I were talking about how, what we're doing to our network. We were network engineers and security engineers, and we're like, this isn't like easy. No. <laughs> so if it's not really like really easy for us, it's like a multi-stage project. You can't expect. And, and for the lay remote worker who doesn't have that skill, I mean, how are you right. ever going to walk them through setting that kind yeah, of like, environment? Yeah, like, oh, you just up. get some Cisco switches, <laughs> build the network, do some trunk <laughs> ports, get the firewall, install PFSense, use your Ubiquity, configure the management uh, interfaces to Ubiquity, which is kind of a pain in the butt, and you host it in the cloud. Then you have a cloud key, which is also your controller, and all that stuff needs yeah. firmware update. Yeah, it gets it gets pretty complex. The other but it gives you nice features. Actually, what I like about uh, Ubiquity, and this is probably better in other uh, systems, you get the control to do the nerdy, geeky stuff, but you also get like the, I want to block this client, like right from the app on my phone. Right. I can block clients, oh, which is nice. that's nice. Yeah. yeah, I don't have that level of integration. I thought uh, the Authenticate interview on Tuesday night in the Silo product. I would love that for home. I agree. Because I yes. think that's a really interesting technology to isolate the browser from being on the local device, yep. which is where a lot of these exploits happen. You push that browser out into the cloud, and uh, uh, people use that, which minimizes the amount of malicious activity coming into the home network. Right. I thought that was a really interesting solution for the remote worker mm -hmm. because it, it, it's taking that browser and getting it outside of the home network, which is where a lot of that compromise happens. And, you know, I didn't think about it in terms of how you cover all your devices, right? Because my, like my family members, I'm sure as many do, right? They've got a phone, they've got a tablet, and they've got some kind of PC or, or laptop, right? Yep. And some of them are shared, like the gaming PC is shared, right? But, you know, the wife has the laptop and a tablet and a phone. Yep. And I'd love to have something like Authenticate protecting the browsing and something like a CrowdStrike on there doing the, uh, you know, kind of endpoint, endpoint stuff, uh, yeah. security, yeah. right? It'd be kind of a nice, like, MSP service for home, right, yeah. to combine those two technologies and just roll that out. Yeah. To the, I don't know how you make that cost-effective, though, yeah, but right? Because those we're talking about is, you know, cost of uh -huh. all this gear and all the software, you know, for your home. Like, what is the... Now you get to do a risk analysis on your home, right? With yep. the number of devices I have, I, I would pay for a monthly service to have access to something like Authenticate and CrowdStrike to protect 
a right. device. And then, of course, just like enterprise security, that doesn't mean you're done. No. Right? Because it gives you a nice base level of security. Right. Because now I got to worry about the sun switch, mm -hmm. the TVs, and any of those other IoT devices. You have a lot more of them in your house than I yeah. do. Right. So like there's another Sonos. attack vector that a CrowdStrike yeah. is not going to run on. So how do you now account for all these other connected devices where you can't put an agent on it, doesn't right. have a browser either, but there's still a, a, a weakness potentially in the home network. Right. And, and I also use, um, I'll tell you what the product is, uh, because uh, Chris had Nagy talked about it on the show. I'm using Q Studio. Not, not, I mean, it's okay. Yeah. It's not great. I'm not overly, like some. It's okay. It's just okay. But some features are really good. Like if it doesn't recognize the website, it won't let people browse to it which I like, as I've said before, like it actually does uh, protect you. Um, but I, I also want to uh, restrict time usage and blackout times for certain devices, mm -hmm. right? And, yep. and I mean, it's, it's independent of security, right? But also has to tie into, there's overlaps, you know, like I said, basically, you want to allow or disallow an app. Uh, I can do that. And it doesn't matter. The nice part about having the client on all those devices is it doesn't matter what it is, if it's a tablet or a phone or a PC, right. it supports everything. Yep. And I can say, yeah, get, I didn't actually have done this. I'm like, no TikTok. Like just right now, TikTok is not allowed, mm. right? So then they find this other one like Likey and I get to make the decision. Is that going to be on the devices or not? Mm. But I want to do the time-based restrictions. And I think the interview we did with Firewall might help me with this, right? Is to take some of my segments because you can't the Q studio is, and I haven't looked into it last. I, I think the answer was no. I want that to be on like my entertain, some of my entertainment devices, right? Mm. So I use Nvidia shield, which is essentially Android. So I'm like, why can't I just drop this on <laughs> that Android uh, device? Right. And I'm not, I'm, I, I have to go back and look and see if that's possible because I also want to restrict what you can do on the entertainment devices as well, right? Like if I don't want the kids to access YouTube, for example, or whatever on those devices, mm -hmm. I want to be able to block it just on those devices. Yeah, because you can't delete it. it like the on school, the new Samsung yeah. TVs, I can't delete YouTube off of it. Is it's that crazy? App. I noticed that with Samsung it, TVs too. You yeah, can't, you can't delete you no it. no control. There, there's a certain set of apps that are shipped with it. They won't let you delete them. Mm -hmm. You can add more. But you can't delete the base apps that are shipped with the TV. It's like, right. come on, I don't, I don't want that on there. But well, you, you can't could. I, you have to figure out how to get the firmware off of it. Yeah, and well, delete the panel. Yeah, like, you might be able to reverse do that, engineer but I can't. <laughs> I haven't reverse engineered the Tizen uh, firmware is the one that Samsung uses. I haven't looked at that in a mm. long time. I think at one time I was looking at some of that uh, firmware. But I, the, when I think about it, I've got like different classes of devices uh, of IoT. There's like the kind of like backbone iot stuff mm -hmm. right like you know your sonos and smart things and your philips hue and your nest and any of that nest kind of stuff. it would yep. i would consider those infrastructure iot devices which i do want to put in their own vlan treat them separately from both a security uh perspective and uh from a bandwidth perspective right and then you've got your entertainment devices, right? So that's like your Xbox, your Nvidia Shield, um, Apple, TV, switches, I have Apple TVs, uh, Nintendo yeah. Switches, right? Entertainment devices are another, maybe TVs fall into that as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got your educational devices. So the Chromebooks that are designated to like, this is what you do your schoolwork on is yet a separate thing. So I can turn off all the entertainment devices mm -hmm and only enable the educa <coughs> educational devices. Now, that's right. not stopping the kids from going, oh, I can go on my school laptop and get YouTube, right? right? right. If it is a school-issued laptop, there are further restrictions on the school actually does, right. um, you know, some of the filtering on top of what you would do on the, the network level. Are the schools issuing your kids uh, devices? Because, like, uh, my yeah, kids, my oldest, they use their... My they oldest use their does, oh, okay. um, but I've got Chromebooks that I've you know bought for recycled all. Re from here yeah yeah a lot of them are recycled <laughs> from here and there's two that i bought just for them um and yeah and a couple of recycled ones as well and since the oldest one was the only one that got a school issued chromebook the other ones were using the other chromebooks and those are really more for school activities yep. right um not so although they will use them for entertainment of right? course if they can bypass any of your other controls yep. they'll try but you know filtering for content and filtering security is basically the same thing right so i can block whole classes of yeah 
uh, things uh, with Q Studio. Like I blocked all chat apps. And the oldest is like, well, I want to do Discord. I'm like, as long as you're admin in your servers, you're fine. And so I whitelisted uh, Discord. Mm. But then it gets in that whole administration. Oh, yeah. And the administration of just the time-based thing is also a pain in the butt, yeah. too. Even with both of us, you know, trying to go on there and do it. It's, it's a pain because you got the blackout window. Like, I don't want them to be able to go on the gaming PC or use the uh, tablets until, like, 10 o'clock. Because I like them to eat breakfast, do some things around the house. Like, you got to do some chores. Right. Then at 10, that's when your your time window yeah. opens. But then, you know, if it's 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning and one of the kids are up and you're like, oh, just go on your iPad for a while. You're like, crap, I got to go on my phone <laughs> and, and adjust the time settings, right? Yeah. It's, it's the same thing with, like, Brendan. You know, he'll, he'll sit on his uh, computer or, or his gaming device, at, at, you know, 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night. I'd love to shut him off, but... Right. You know, he's also 17, so yeah. it gets a little harder. So. so I think what I'm coming down to is an administrative network, right, which is our devices, right, the, the, your own personal laptops and devices, right, your work computer, mm -hmm. right? Then you've got your infrastructure IoT, entertainment IoT, uh, and devices. I would probably put those in the same class, like the iPads and, uh, you know, your Apple TVs. I'd put them in the same class because those are entertainment devices, yeah. right? Uh, and then you've got your educational devices. And then where do you put the wife stuff? It's like if you filter me or whatever, I'm going to be really mad. Oh. <laughs> right? Yeah. Anytime Lauren can't get to a site, she's yeah. like, oh, what secure, What? What filtering do you have? I'm like, I don't have any. I swear I right. don't. Right. Because I can't. <laughs> she'll, right. she'll like rip my head off. My kids are younger, so I, I do have to filter for content so they don't. the right. younger ones don't accidentally yeah. stumble across something, which that gets hard because YouTube is like the Moss Eisley of uh, video sites, right? Like yeah. wretched hive of scum and villainy. Yeah. But filtering on the platform is super hard. I don't know of a great solution uh, or really any solution for that. No. No, they don't. And YouTube Kids is, eh. Yeah, that also has the sim similar yeah. kind of issues. Right. Yeah. They quickly grow out of that, though. Yeah, they do. The YouTube. Like my youngest is still on the, he'll still do YouTube Kids, but... It's not much longer before he's like, yeah, I want the actual YouTube, <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah, Kyle's the big YouTube user in the house. Mm -hmm. So I, I have QStudio on his machine just to see what he's doing. I don't block anything. Right. I'm just using it for monitoring. QStudio is a good monitoring. Yeah. For I that. use so it for I can monitoring. see what sites they go to, right. what, things like that, right? What gets flagged as potential. Yeah. Then I got to go down and educate. I'm like, all right, I can't go to that site. But I haven't put any blocking in place yet. Yeah. I just want to kind of see what he's doing down there. Um, just to protect him too, but uh, that's why I different. I do it as well. I actually like access to the. I mean, Chris Adnagi was talking about this. I think last year on the show. Yeah, you know, monitoring to make sure there's not like sexual predators right. communicating with your children. Yeah. Like that's important, and I understand the privacy side of things, obviously, right? But you know, this should be. Uh, I like to have that open conversation. Yes, I'm gonna look at your messages, but I'm not snooping on you, right? It's for their own protection. So what you just came up with is about four different micro segmented networks in your house yes yeah i think that's what i'm coming down to right because i'm trying to balance both uh you know performance security and functionality for for usage yep. uh, as well I, I guess if you don't have you know a lot of younger kids at the home and you don't need to put those time restrictions on or things like that yeah, but how many simplify but how many but home workers do have small kids at home yeah a lot. right yeah. there's a lot and and so it is a concern I think for a lot of people that are now not in the office mm -hmm. and have to figure out how best to kind of secure the environment, which includes the kids, because now the kids are home. I mean, yeah. we originally were going to go back five days a week, but now we're down to two, two days yeah, a week. Exactly. And so three days a week, kids are going to be home mm -hmm. for a lot of these schools. I think up on, in Massachusetts, it's all remote for the first semester mm -hmm. right now is what I heard. So kids are going to be at home. A lot more uh, next year for the school year. So that puts a lot more pressure, I think, on, on folks that are working remotely from home. Right. Yeah. Also, I like, um, you know, having the computer, like a gaming PC in a central place where you can see it, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why I want to uh, kind of restrict where they can consume certain content, right? Like, I, I don't want you, like, in the basement on the TV watching YouTube because then you can't really see yeah. if something bad pops up on YouTube, right? Right. 
uh, and, and also then they go in the basement and they're like, we call it rotting, right? <laughs> my middle one's the, the classic uh, rotter in the house. And you just go down there and like watch TV. It's like, dude, you got to go outside and play, right? Yeah. But also you don't want them to like escape to another portion of the house. But like in the bed, like we like to watch Star Wars movies at night before bed. That's like our bonding thing. So, you know, time limits and restrictions, I think, are, are definitely part of the equation. And also separating those devices out to limit your risk, right? Because the entertainment devices have a much higher risk uh, of causing an impact. And maybe some of the infrastructure, I mean, the infrastructure certainly does as well. Um, but you want to isolate, I think, your infrastructure, um, like your thermostats and things like that, from the rest of the entertainment. Yes. To prevent that kind of cross-pollination. So that's the model that I'm, I'm working on. And, I'm, uh, you know, if anyone has any suggestions, uh, you know where to find us. Come in our Discord channel. Uh we should probably create maybe a separate chat channel in our Discord to talk about home net because I think it is a very good discussion point. Uh, and I think there's going to be a lot of advances in technology in this area. And I'm sure I'm missing some too. Yeah, I, it, someone just dropped in the Black Hills. Um, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, post. Josh got a crazy home yeah. setup. Yeah. yeah. So they're, they, they are dropping some, some uh, things in there for, for the Discord users right now. Sweet. I think uh, our time's up for this segment. Is yes. that true? Yeah, that means we have to do more tech segments on this soon. Yes. So stay tuned for that and stay tuned for more micro interviews and, of course, Paul Security Weekly. <laughs>